Hey, I'm Jerry Levinson, and this is the Flooring Business Podcast, where each week we talk to expert flooring dealers, suppliers, marketing experts, software experts, and anyone who I believe is going to help you in your flooring business, or in this case, sell your flooring business. Uh, my mission is to give you good information that will help you reach your goals. If you're just starting your business, trying to reach $5 million in sales, or you're ready to sell your business, you're going to find useful information that's going to help you reach your goals and profit now in the flooring industry. And remember, each Thursday, I offer sales training that's good for your entire team. That's only 150 per month, and it's gonna more than pay for itself over and over again, as I show you ways to close more sales at higher prices. Now, in this week, I have a gentleman I met on LinkedIn, Chris Allman of Brown Financial Advisory, and we had a, a interesting conversation on LinkedIn and, and uh, we, we touched base with each other to talk about selling the business and more about like the aftermath, you know, what do you need to know? So we're going to discuss that about how do you sell your business and what do you need to know after you sell a business? What, what are the things that you should consider? So welcome, Chris. Hey, Jerry, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. So Glad how long have you been doing this? Um, and, and you're not in the space of selling businesses, but in the financial advisory space, but um, helping people navigate that process as well. But how long have you been in your business? So I started um, about 10 years ago and I started in the financial planning world. Like that's where I shine, I guess. That's where my skill set is at, is in financial planning. Um, but a couple of years ago, I, I came across... Um, a couple of business owners that I was working with and just really found that the problem that they had was that they were ready to sell their business, but they weren't ready, if that makes sense. The, they were ready to get out, but their business wasn't ready. They didn't know what to expect, how much they were going to get if they actually sold it. And so while we had a financial plan for them and we kind of had the future mapped out what they wanted to do, they just really didn't have any idea of what the business was going to contribute to that. And they thought that it would contribute a lot, um, but that was you know, the assumption. They didn't really know. And so that's, that's kind of how I got started into it. I just really fell in love with that. And, and the further I got along in it, the more I realized um, it's a really big problem. You know, a lot of owners don't have any real exit plan. They don't know what their business is worth. Oh, yeah. I talk to flooring dealers all the time who are ready to sell their business, would like to get out, either retire or do something else. And they've they don't have the system down. They don't they don't have anything to sell. They're not prepared in yeah. any fashion, or they don't really have a business that's worth any money. Yeah. So the, one of the the interesting statistics is that it's like seventy five percent roughly of business owners expect to sell their business and extract some kind of value that's going to help pay for their retirement. You know, so they're counting on that as an asset to help fund their retirement. And unfortunately for that small to mid-sized uh, business, you know, mid-size, I mean, mid-cap, it gets huge. But in the smaller side of things, it's 80% of businesses don't sell. Right, wow. Right, so that's a big problem if you have 65, 75% of owners that are counting on their business to help fund their lifestyle and their goals and stuff after they get out and 80% of them don't sell. They just close the doors, huh? Yeah. I mean, and that's a sell. I mean, that's a way to get out. You liquidate what you have and that's, you know, that's one way to exit, but it may not be the one that you need. So. No. And I, I try to teach people that, Hey, you have an asset that appreciates in value and it's good. And, and you might even be paying your employees more money than you're making. But at the end of the day, you have an asset that's building in value that should be worth money someday, but you got to prepare it. Right. All right. So I want to go over the three stages of selling your business that you sent um, right off the bat. And everybody wants to know this is how do you figure out how much you can sell your business for? How do you figure out what it's worth? Yeah, that's a, that's a question I get a lot. And, um, and honestly, it comes down to, I mean, 95% of the time, it's going to come down to what is the perceived value of your business that the buyer has. You know, so it, Price is what you're going to sell it for, right? That's what you're going to get out of it. But 
that price is determined by what they perceive the value of your business to be. And that's going to be different depending on what kind of buyer it is. You know, is it someone that wants to buy your business and run it themselves and be very involved? Is it going to be somebody that's hands off? They just want to buy it, let it run, you know, make sure they've got people in place. Is it a strategic buyer, somebody that wants to absorb you into their business so they can get into your market or whatever it may be? They're all going to have different ideas of what your business is worth. Yeah, so it's really all over the board. In 2013, I sold a window covering business and I was looking for two and a half to three times multiple, but my multiple included all the stuff that I used to, you know, we include things like your cell phone, your car, you, the things you're paying for yourself personally out of your business. And so the person, the, the company that bought it did give me three times multiple, but they figured that multiple way lower than I did. <laughs> so um, they use a number off my P and L's that was, you know, about $50,000 less and said, yep, here you go. Three times multiple. And then in the way they structured it and all that. So, uh, but we had to do a lot of finagling to get where we both wanted to be because, um, I did get a good job out of it with a good income. Um, they were paying off some things, debt, some debts that the business had. Right. Um, that wasn't factored into it. So uh, the deal did end up working good for me, but um, it took a lot of work to get there. And it takes a lot more time. I mean, how much time does it take? You know, when somebody says, I want to sell a business, I mean, it can take months or years to find a buyer. And then once you do, to hash out a deal, that can take even to get a hungry buyer. Yeah, the the kind of recommended time that I have is about three years out. I mean, because that gives you a lot of time to really invest in getting it ready, you know, instead of just focusing on kind of making it through the next day, the next year, really have a, a plan that you can lay out. Um, but, you know, what you were referring to as far as the things that they were, you know, discounting back, if you will, we call those ad backs. Um, so you have your EBITDA, your earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. So that's kind of like a, an easy way to get a, a value. But then you have to also add back all the things that the business pays for that, you know, if a new owner buys that business, they may not be paying for those things. You know, they may not pay you the same salary um, or they pay the same salary to someone else that they can hire that you've been taking. You know, they may not give that person a company car and the cell phone and all the things. Uh, that tend to add up. So, you know, those are the things that they're going to consider, which then, you know, you want to have those things in place beforehand, before you, you know, go to the market, you want to be able to show exactly, you know, kind of what your business is worth, uh, be able to really explain those details so that there's not much that they can add back because yeah. they're going to do their best to, to bring your price down. Right. Everything's negotiable. So they're going to negotiate the hell out of it and it's going <laughs> to, <laughs> and it might hurt, but, uh, yeah. and it, it might be tough to pass it up because it's a willing buyer. So is it worth it? And kind of more of what we're going to get into is like, you know, the price that they're offering, is that worth it? Are you going to be able to, you know, survive retirement with what they offer? If right. That's what you're using to do. Yeah. So, do you have any clue what you typically get down in a business that is all over the map as well? Like if you're selling your business, small business says for a million dollars, you know, are you going to get the million up front or is it likely going to be a, a down payment and a, and a payout? You know, again, it comes down to, well, what kind of buyer do you have? You know, if it's someone that's wanting to take over your business and kind of run and do the same things that you're doing, they may not have a lot of capital, a lot of cash to put into your business right away. So it might be that you're, you know, essentially financing their purchase of your business. Right. If it's a strategic buyer, on the other hand, they may just be buying you to add your business on to theirs and they don't really need any of your people even, uh, you know, any of the things that you have, they just need access to your area. And so they may be willing to just pay you and tell you goodbye. So right. and it's going to be all over the board in terms of, you know, what you receive. There's not really a good rule of thumb, um, unfortunately. So. I know it's typical that 
the owner ends up carrying a note and you can get interest on that. And sometimes it, again, it's negotiated. I got 0% interest. So I didn't get any yeah. interest on, on that, on those payments. And they came regularly and there are companies and services that will buy that note too at a discount um, after you've been paid for so many months um, and not on all businesses, they'll, they'll assess right. that risk. Um, but the other thing that you got to consider when you sell the business is, let's say you get half down. Well, whatever those broker fees are, if somebody sold it for you, you got to pay that broker out of that down payment. You don't pay him mm -hmm. over time. So you got to deduct that from the equation as well. Yeah, it's definitely a cost. A lot of times, you know, the owners don't realize that um, there's a difference between, you know, when you're ready to sell the business and if you reach out to a business broker or a mergers and acquisitions guy, M&A advisor, they're, they're, when you go to them, they're going to sell your business for what it's worth right then it, most of the time. So if you've prepared your business to be as valuable as it can be at that point, great. They're going to help you make a market a lot of times and help find buyers, right? Versus um, really kind of going at it on your own. Maybe you just, you know, try to list it through biz buy sell or something like that. Um, you know, it's a lot, a lot of times you're not going to get as much it just depends on the quality of the buyers and, and who's looking. So sometimes you may pay the advisor a little bit more to help you sell the business. But at the end of the day, um, you know, most of the time they're going to help you find more offers, or at least that's their job is to help you really find more offers. Now, sometimes there may not be, they're not being, might not be a market for your business. You know, it might not be that, um, that there's a lot of people looking to get into your specific business, but, um, but that's really their goal is to try to help you find those people. It, what I was looking to do right from the start was, I, I mean, I started my business with the idea of selling it. You know, I wanted to keep this business for yeah. five to 10 years, but I wanted to sell it, uh, build it up and sell it. And I was hoping to get more than the EBITDA would recommend. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted it to have value that went beyond the numbers. So processes or systems that a large corporation can use into their systems and, and things like that. That was my idea. Didn't work out that way. My son ended up buying it. But I mean, everything worked out fantastic for me. But, uh, but that was my idea is that I, if I can build the right processes and systems and have some unique value to my business that'll make it more attractive and then I can get more money for it than, than maybe what it's worth. Right. So, um, all right. So now we can get into your expertise here. I wanted to at least cover that part. So yeah. typically when you're selling the business, um, most people are done making money, right? Um, so what you're not going to have any more income from work, right? So what you're selling the business for and your savings is what you may need to live on the rest of your life. So how do people, is that right? And, and how do people yeah. plan for that? Yeah. So it's essentially, let's kind of back up just a second. So the, the you mentioned a minute ago, there's three stages of kind of an exit plan. And <laughs> the first stage is to just really discover where you're at you know, really get an understanding of, okay, what's my situation? What's my business worth? Um, you know, you start looking forward to retirement and being out of the business. What kind of income do you need? What kind of lifestyle do you want to live? And then those two things really pair together because you can't necessarily fund your lifestyle without the business. And right. for most business owners, that's their largest asset is going to be their business. So it makes sense to really get a, a good um, picture of, of your current situation. And so that first stage really being the discovery phase. And, you know, I mentioned a minute ago that the way that you determine the price that you'll sell for comes down to the value, right? So how do you determine the value? And that's where I always introduce the process. It's called the value acceleration methodology. And so it's taught by the Exit Planning Institute. Um, and it's a, a great way to accelerate your value for your exit. Um, it can be done, you know, in a year's time frame. although I would say, you know, you should start at the beginning like you did with your business, really try to focus on 
what is my ultimate end goal for my business? And it might be that your goal is that you don't want to sell it. You just want to work and work and work until you're ready to get out. You know, when you're you know 80 years old, it's like, all right, I'll hang up my hat and that's fine. But that's, that's your plan, right? So you want to make sure that if you're not going to sell it, that you're still saving correctly and that sort of thing. So that first stage of discovering, you know, where you're at, that's a big part of it. Um, so to do that, there's a lot of tools out there that, you know, you can kind of go through on your own. They're, they're self, I guess, self-guided. Um, but I typically refer to either the certified valuation analyst, which is the CPA usually uh, that specializes in valuations or um, a certified exit planning advisor. And so uh, they're most likely a value advisor. So that's all they do is, you know, understand the value, help you grow the value of your business so that you can sell it. And when you're getting started, it doesn't have to be precise, right? right? So your industry, you know, kind of the range of multiples. I mean, you've just being in it long enough, you, you start to talk to people, you understand kind of what other people are getting. So you've got to determine, you know, what is best in class and then what is, you know, the bottom of the barrel, right? So once you've kind of determined those parameters, now you can say, okay, well, you know, different multiples along that line where are you going to fall right now, right? Because that's that's the, the main point is to know where you're at right now. Um, and then you can talk about where you wanna go. Um, but that's, you know, in that first phase there is really determining where are you. Um, so that's a little bass backwards from goal setting too, because when we talk about goal setting, I talk about this in master classes and things like that. When you're running a business, it's always, uh, where do you want to go is, is first, what's that destination? Mm -hmm. And then, then you look at where you're at and then you look at how are you going to get there? What's that map <laughs> to get there? Yeah. So, you know, you get the valuation, you, you're able to say, okay, you know, here's about what my company is worth today. And then the next step is understanding, well, what's your personal situation? Where are you at financially on your, your own personal finances? Right. And, and what do you want your life to look like, you know, going forward? Um, and so you have, you know, you work with a financial planner, you, you develop a plan, you understand what your assets are worth, how much you have in investments, how much you have in, um, you know, maybe it's social security, you know, what's your spouse got, those sort of things. And then once you understand, okay, here's how much I have financially here. And the next part is determining, well, what do you want life to look like, right? And so once you build out that picture of, all right, my future, here's what I want to do. You know, it might just be, I just want to maintain the, the kind of income I have now. Just want to keep keep going, but without the work. So that's, that's easy enough for a financial planner to tell you, okay, here's how much that's going to cost, right? So then once you, once you understand that and you know where your business value is, now you've got your value gap, like, that tells you how much your business needs to grow over the future in order to fund the retirement that you're looking for. And the best exit planning strategy I've heard really is to have a spouse that's still working and making a ton of money. So you don't have to. <laughs> yeah. Or inherit a bunch. Well, well, I'm working on that right now. So uh, let's see <laughs> if we can find that. Um, so you said something that was really interesting though. Uh, uh, the exit planning Institute. Talk about that a little bit. Yeah, so it's a great organization. It started, I think it's been 15 plus 20 years now ago, but it was purchased by um, a private, like some private owners. It's a family that bought it. Uh, Chris Snyder is the owner and his son, Scott Snyder, um, have really, over the last few years, put a lot of emphasis into growing the, the education around exit planning. Because there's a, a huge paradigm that, that seems to be out there where most owners think of exit planning as what you do when you're ready to exit. Um, and there's a shift that has to happen because that's really not what it is. Exit planning is just good business strategy. You know, if you're growing the value of your business, that's the best metric of performance is right. to know, you know, is the value of your business growing? If it's growing, then your profits are going to be growing. The cash flow is going to be growing. Everything else is going to follow that. But that's one of the ways that you can track that. 
And the goal of exit planning is really to make the exit timing irrelevant so that you're always ready to exit, which gives you more opportunities. Exactly. So, I mean, they, uh, I said this too, when I started is I want the ability to sell my business for yeah, it doesn't mean you have to in this time. Right. So, and everybody should be thinking of it in that terms because it really will make your business more valuable, grow, make it more profitable. And most of all, make it run without you. And there's a lot of people in our industry that, you know, if they're not in their business, they don't have a business that, you know, so they, they basically own a job, not a business. Right. If, if you can't sell it, it's not really a business. And that's not meant to be insulting to people, but that's just a reality. If you're the main guy wearing all the hats, then, you know, you, you need to learn how to have a business that is sellable. Right. Yeah, and then what if you get sick? I mean, what if you get injured or sick uh, uh, again? What are the risks? So if you have a business that you can sell, then you have a business that operates without you. Right. And that's the goal. I mean, or at least in my opinion, that should always be the goal. Should be. Unless you're, you know, not every business is sellable, right? right. You know, it's, it's kind of like doctors in our area. They build a practice. Um, but it's just as easy for someone that's right out of college that has all the same credentials and everything to go and hang out a shingle, open up their own practice. And because there's so many people moving here, it doesn't really make sense for him to pay someone to start his business, right? Like he can get the financing and everything he needs to open up. And then there's so many people, there's not enough doctors. I mean, it's the only thing that you would be buying would be maybe some of the equipment. At a, at a discounted value, but otherwise you're not really going to get much out of it because as soon as that doctor closes, you know, his staff's going to be looking for somewhere to go. You know, why am I going to pay him to, to get his employees when he closes? I'll just take them anyway. So, you know, that's, that's kind of the mindset. Not every business is going to be sellable, but you need to know that you need to know like, well, what's your market like? Um, because it's going to be different for everyone. You said some my um, question I should probably save till later, but I do want to ask you now. Uh, what where's your location, and is that relevant to who you can serve? Like, can can anybody call you for help, advice, information, hire you if they wish, uh, or are you do you have to work in a certain location? No, so I am currently in Fairhope, Alabama. So it's a great little town that used to be quaint. Uh, it's growing like crazy. Uh, the county that I'm in is, I think, the seventh seventh fastest growing county in the country. So it's it's growing like crazy. Um, but we've got clients in a lot of different states, right? Not it's not just here locally. So being a financial planner. Um, it's we're registered with the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission. So um, we do manage money for people. We you know do the planning work, which is really what my focus is on is the exit planning and preparing them on their personal financial side, right? And then I've got people that I refer to that go into the business um, that really do the consulting part of that. You know, and it might be that you know you understand your business. That's what you're here to do is help other. Uh, business owners in your business to help them improve. And so you have a good understanding of how your business works. I have a good understanding of how the finances work and how to prepare a lot of those things to make it work, but I'm not going to help you fix your business, right? There's guys that that's all they do. Um, but, you know, I've got clients all over the country. Um, probably a third of our clients are not in state. So um, you know, that, and that's happened a lot of different ways. Some of them lived here at one point and moved off. Um, but it's, it's really, you know, just kind of like we reached out through LinkedIn, got to know each other a little bit. It's just making the connection. I'm always happy to, to do that. So LinkedIn. Yeah, you asked some questions that I, I wanted to shoot back and not be a smart Alec, but, uh, <laughs> you know, about, you know, what people don't know what they're, uh, don't know how to prepare to sell their business. And I was thinking, well, most people don't even think about selling their business. Yeah. So I wish they would understand that it, it is an asset that they should have that they know they can sell someday. 
Yeah. And, and that, that comment that you had, it really does depend on the type of business you're running. So some of the people I've talked with that are the entrepreneurs that are in more of the tech space or the medical field, their goal is to grow it as quickly as possible and get out, right? They just, they just want the big payday and then they're done. Um, but there's a lot of planning that has to happen in that process. You know, they've got a lot of moving parts and they have shorter timeframes. But the thing that I find that's great about those is that they are focused on their exit. So they know exactly what they want. They know what they need to get out uh, and what they're hoping for, because they know that that's going to set them up for whatever that next project is or, or whatever it may be that they're going after next. Um, but a lot of times when you're not in that space and you get into the business because you love it and you're good at it, you know, it's, it's a different ballgame. Right. You may not be thinking about exiting necessarily. And that's what I was saying. Exit planning is just good business strategy. It's not about getting out. It's about making your exit timing irrelevant. So well, the funny thing with me is that uh, I'll advise this to the flooring dealers out there. And that was my idea when I had the flooring business. And yet I'm in a, a business now where I'm probably not going to be able to sell my coaching or consulting business because it's mostly about me. So, you right. know, I can criticize them that you guys just own a job. Well, that's, that's what I'm doing right now. I own a job. So yeah, but so. there's, there's flexibility that comes with that. And like I said, oh, yeah. it depends on what your goals are. You know, you may not, you may, you may be doing what you do because you just love it. Right. It's right. just, it's more than anything. It almost feels like a hobby. Like they're yeah. paying me to work. So that's where I'm at. You know, I can do things that I enjoy doing without worrying about right. the income as much. Yeah. So I know we talked a little bit about that, that first stage and there's a couple of things I wanted to mention. Um, when you've determined, you know, the value of your business and you've determined what you need and you figure out what your value gap is, um, that's kind of, okay, well, well, that's what you need. That's how it needs to grow. Um, but a lot of times the owners are the ones that are ready to get out and the business, there's this, um, it's really, it's interesting to see because you'll have a lot of business owners that are ready to get out of the business and they think that their business is very attractive, right? So, well, sure. Somebody would want to buy my business. I, you know, I have this kind of cash flow. I take this kind of salary. It's great. Why wouldn't someone want to buy that? Um, and so one of the, the questions I ask is there's business readiness and business attractiveness. And the, you know, the business might be really attractive on the outside. So, you know, to a potential buyer, and, and this is what you find out a lot of times when you go to a business broker, you know, they're going to say, okay, well, you know, we'll kind of put it out there, put some feelers out there. And it's like, you might get some interest and in they come back and the prices are pretty good. You're like, oh, you know, it looks attractive. But then as they get closer to it and they start asking you for financials and that sort of thing, you find out, okay, the business isn't quite ready. They're, you know, they're asking for my books and they're asking for these different things. And once they get that, they're like, yeah, I wouldn't touch this business. You know, just, on the outside, uh, it looks great. It's attractive. On the inside, it's not, not ready. And so another one of the, the processes that I go through is understanding, you know, what's the business attractiveness, the readiness score. So kind of, you know, it's a self scoring system that you can go through and really just place yourself on, um, on a scale of where you're at, you know, where the business is at, how attractive it is, how ready is it? Um, and there's a lot of things that come into you know, how ready it is. Um, one of them being, you know, do you have contracts and what's your customer base look like? And, um, you know, what kind of management team do you have? And just all the things that really help your business run and keep it running, like you said, when you're not there. Um, do you, you have, do you have having, that? is that something that somebody can get, download and fill out themselves? Yeah, there's a couple of different tools. Um, most of the time, you know, I'll either, I'll go through it with someone or I'll refer them to one of the value advisors and, and they take that in addition to, you know, the, some of the assessments that they go through to, to determine the value. And that's what they use to kind of help determine what multiple you would get right now. Yeah. Um, I don't do it a whole lot. That's kind of a little bit more towards the business side of things, but I do want to be in that conversation because it helps me understand where are they at on their personal, like, you know, life after business, what, how ready are they to get there? <laughs> um, 
you know, and that's a lot of times cool that helps them evaluate their business is good. I want to share with them because uh, it, it's uh, what's the term I'm thinking of that, that uh, you look at your business, the threats, the opportunities. Yeah. The SWOT analysis, SWOT, SWOT analysis, yeah. you know, if that readiness score is kind of like that, where it is. You, yeah. That's a great or, way to do it. Um, and you can, you know, you could do it in a self-assessment and say, okay, well, do I have a management team? that can run the business without me. So if I took vacation for a month, would they have to call me for anything? Right. right. It's an easy way to, to say how reliant on the on me is the business. And if you could say, yeah, I could be gone for a month and it would be fine, then yeah, you, you would score yourself pretty high in that area. But then you might say, okay, well, um, you know, who are our customers? Do we have one that's highly concentrated or, or a handful that that's where most of our business comes from? And that might be that you had a contract with, you know, being in the flooring, it might be that you're doing an apartment complex and you have, you know, a management company that, that they use you right. to replace all their flooring, you know, on a regular basis. So, you know, having a contract, if, if that's where most of your business comes from, then you're too concentrated in one, you know, one contract, you need to have others. And, and those are all right. different things that you can assess on your own, even, and just say, you know, here's kind of where I'm at on that. And then you can see what you need to work on. Right. Right. So um, I think we're ready for stage two, right? So yeah. you said uh, on stage two, protect what you have and improve. So what are some of the ways that people can start planning for the future if they haven't already? What are the SMART goals? Yeah, so stage two is really about preparing. So in the in, at the end of stage one, you've got where you're wanting to go. You have you know, kind of clear expectations for your future and, and what the business needs to do and you create your action plan, right? So if it's on the, on the personal side, it might be that you need to have a will, you need to have some life insurance, you need to have some things buttoned up really, you know, just have a good um, solid plan on what you need to do financially and, and on the personal side. And then you make that same action plan for your business, right? Because there's three parts to that successful plan and I refer to it as a master plan. So it's your personal business and financial goals at the end of the day. And you can't have a successful exit without having one of those pieces of the stool, right? So there's three legs to that stool. One of them goes, the whole thing falls over, right? So on the, the personal planning is um, really understanding, well, you know, this is what I want to do. This is kind of how I want life to look. I've got these things that are really important to me. It might be family, it might be travel, whatever, it doesn't matter. Um, but that's kind of your motivation. Then you have the financial side. You need to know how much that costs and you have a plan for that. And then you've got what the business plans are, which might be improving the marketing, improving your contracts and all those things that we mentioned a minute ago. Um, so if you take one of those away, you know, it's, it kind of just falls. You, you can't sell your business if you haven't improved it, right? You're not going to get the money that you need to fund those goals if you're not improving the business. And so it's about preparing it. And, you know, one of the best ways to do that is, is you know, once you've created an action plan, set some deadlines for yourself, right? And um, I'm sure you probably do this when you do go through some of the coaching stuff. It's like, let's, you know, write out what you're going to do. I usually recommend 90 days, like a 90 day sprint, Right. And essentially creating five goals, five things that you need to accomplish on your personal side. So five personal goals, which might be a, you know, when I get out, I really love golfing. I'm going to golf every day. Okay. Well, you know, how much do you play golf now? Have you ever played golf for five days straight? I guarantee you, you won't do it again <laughs> unless you're wanting to go professional, but because you will be so sore and you probably won't play for another couple of weeks. And, you know, once you've done that a few times, that's going to get old. Right. So the personal side might be, you know, I want to kind of explore some of the op opportunities that I have, some of the, the passions I have, hobbies, whatever. Um, you know, another goal might be to talk with your family about it. You know, so that's it, when you get out, a lot of times that's your identity. You've that's who you are. That's who people know you as in the community. So when you're not doing that anymore, who are you? You know, what, what are you going to be doing? 
and, and just really explore that. And then on the financial side, it might be that you need to update your will. Um, you need to have an estate plan. You need to have, um, you know, insurance, disability insurance, things like that, in case something happens to you today, which, you know, I, I hate to say it, but about 50% of business owners exit unexpectedly because of divorce or disagreements between the partners, yeah. some kind of distress in the company, you know, large competitor or whatever it may be. Um, and then of course there's disabilities and deaths. So it's, you know, that happens more often than you think. And so having some of those things in place also adds stability to your business. It doesn't seem like it up front, but once you start going through that process, you'll really see how that, that works. So you set five, you know, personal goals, and then you set five, either business or financial goals to accomplish that quarter, um, that 90 days, you know, the business is going to be something that you'll want to talk with your employees about and really, you know, bring them in. If you have a management team, if you have other people that, you know, that are, you rely on heavily to get the work done, you know, bring those people in and, and talk about the metrics. What are we good at? What do we need to improve on? And then you set those 90 day kind of sprints and then, you know, you break it back into, we're going to have like weekly meetings and I hate meetings. I usually call them huddles because it shouldn't be more than like 10, 15 minutes tops with specifically the people that you need to talk to. So don't try to meet with everyone. You're just wasting everyone's time, including your own. So. Yeah, actually we're, we're real strong on weekly meetings as far as advising them to do that. Um, and then everything you're saying is true as far as operating the business, but you wouldn't bring those people in when it doesn't have to be about your exit selling your business. Yeah. yeah. And I understand get real that. skittish about that. <laughs> A lot of owners are terrified that somebody will find out that they're you know, thinking about selling their business, but that's, that's kind of that paradigm shift that has to happen where, you know, I'm talking about exit planning, but it's not about selling right now. It's about being prepared in case I have to sell. Yeah. Making sure that you've got stuff in place today. You know, let's say it's your first year of being in the business. You just celebrated a year. And what happens if something happens to you tomorrow? <laughs> right. Like you can't come in, you've got cancer, you're out for the next six months with chemo and everything else. Like, mm -hmm. does your life fall apart? That, that leads me to the next question, too, was uh, we've got just a lot of new guys that are in the business. Uh, they're installers that are transitioning over into retail um, and they're just starting their business out. What would you tell them about all this uh, um, exit strategy? I mean, they're, they're brand new. Yeah, no, I love it. Um, it's, it shouldn't be scary, right? Starting a business was the scary part, you know, bringing in customers and clients and getting people to work with. That's the hard part. This is just really focusing on building value that's transferable in your business. And so if you think about all the things that you rely on yourself for, starting in that first year or two years, um, you know, really look at it and say, okay, what do I do that someone else can do fairly easily? You know, what are the things that rely on me right now that I really shouldn't be doing and that might be the actual installations. Well, when you first start, it might just be you. You have to do that. Like that's a big part of it. You're more of the practitioner. But as you grow, you know, who are the people that you're going to bring in? What roles are they going to serve? And start thinking about it that way. It's, you know, basically trying to take yourself out of a job. Right. And so that's on the business side of it. You know, there's a lot of, a lot of things that you can do there to really make sure that uh, that, that works well. But then on the personal side of it, it's really just trying to understand, well, what kind of lifestyle do you want to have, right? Like, where are you spending your money? And just kind of getting a general feel for where you want your business to go. How big do you want to get? Um, because like I said, you know, everybody has a different idea of, of what it means to be successful. For me, it's not an ending. It's the journey along the way. That's where the success is, is that you're doing what you love. Yeah. So you know, really, what do you, what do you want to see going forward? Don't let it sound like it's this big thing out there that, man, I got to figure this out and I don't know where to start. Just start by setting some of those goals on deciding where you want to be and then think, okay, well, if I want to do that, if I want to be there, 
What do I need to be doing right now? Uh, because like I said, it's just business strategy. It's just being prepared. It, you know, so on the personal side, it's making sure that you're saving, that you have savings set aside. So if something happens, hey, you know, you know, it doesn't matter that you're out for a couple of weeks. You've got some savings there to, so that you're not going into debt. And oh, you know, that brings us to, to you've got some disability insurance. You know, it'll pay you to keep, keep you know, keep up your uh, your lifestyle. So it really brings us to stage three. So you're you're you did good at step one and two. You're prepared. Mm-hmm. You're in a great position. You don't have to sell your business right now, but you're right. capable of doing it. So that gives you a lot of options. Um, and that really options it uh, up to who you're going to sell it to. Is that a competitor, uh, an employee, one of your kids? The kid thing is funny because I sold my business to my kid. And, and some people are like, oh, you wouldn't dare sell it to your kid. I mean, how can you make them pay you for it? Well, it's a legitimate business. It's, it's worth money. So uh, yeah. we made an agreement and that we both agreed on and, and I sold the business to them. Um, somebody looking to invest in the business. Uh, the first business I sold a blind business was to somebody that wanted to be in Arizona, their nationwide company. And I was the first retail business they invested in because they wanted to be in, a, in Arizona and they weren't successful here. So they saw I was very successful here and thought they could get that by buying my business. Yeah. Um, of course, it didn't work out for them, but I did get paid in full at least. <laughs> so, uh, did you buy the business back from them? <laughs> but that no, um, I I've, say, I've seen that handful up of under time. the same name. You know, I, I I don't have any desire to do that, but if I wanted to, I'd probably just turn around and start that business up and use that name again. It was called Blind Devotion, and uh, yeah, if I wanted to, I probably could start it up again. They wouldn't. They're not in this area at all. Yeah. So, um. So that, that is another opportunity that can come your way is to buy the business back or just to get it back if they don't pay you for the business. But uh, now employees kind of an interesting one because obviously you would have to let the employee know, but I would only do that to a really key employee that showed interest right. in the business. Yeah, I mean, you know who those people are. A lot of times you you get a feeling for, um, their work ethic, you know, what their, their goals are, you know, where do they want to be as they're growing in the business and, and you see them develop, you get an idea, you know, and at some point you don't have to tell them early on, but you could just, you know, as part of your overall business strategy, you want to know, Hey, if something happens to me today, who, who is going to run this business? Right. And that's a big, big question I get a lot of times is around the legacy you know, if something happens to me or if I get out, what happens to my uh, my employees? Because especially if you've been working with them a long time, they're going to feel like family. You, know, right. you spend just as much time with them as you probably do your own family, if not more. Um, so you really do care about them. And that's one of the things that I found for most small business owners is they care more about what happens to their employees and how well they're taken care of than they care about how much money they get out of the business. Right. And, and I think that's awesome. You know, I, I think that those people put so much into um, their community, you know, as an owner, you're pouring so much into the community, you're, you're hiring people, you're taking care of people, um, giving them opportunities. But, you know, my, for my side, I want you to have an opportunity too. you know, I want you to have a successful future, because if 80% of those businesses don't sell, that leaves a lot of people that were doing such great work in their community just kind of left empty handed. So um, you mentioned, you know, who do you um, sell it to? And that's one of the things I, I like talking about a lot is just understanding what your options are. And it's going to be different. I mean, it doesn't matter if you're in the flooring business where you're at or where I'm at. I mean, you're going to have completely different opportunities. Um, so you mentioned the, the family members. Um, and I'll tell you, that's the vast majority of like, smaller businesses plan to leave it to a family member. Um, the statistics though are kind of sad on that. It's about 23% that actually make it past the second generation. Most of them don't make it through that second generation. So, you know, kind of keeping that in mind, um, 
you have to have a plan in place so that as they take over, as they come in, you set them up for success. You know, just expecting them to run it just like you did, it's not going to work because they're going to have different goals than you when they start that business, when they get into it. Your goal might have been, I'm just going to do this as long as I can. And then, you know, hopefully one of these family members, one of my kids will take it over and, and they'll be just fine. But they're going to have different goals. Even if they like the same business, they're going to want to take it to a different place than maybe you did. And so you really wow. have to develop their understanding of what they want um, as you two different scenarios out there. There's the person that wants to sell it to their kid, wants the kid to take over, but that kid really doesn't have interest in it. So right. that's where it's going to fall apart. And then a lot of times, yeah. yeah, but there's a lot of kids out there who want to do things different than their parents did. And a lot of that is, is getting into the technology, raising the prices and they're getting a lot of pushback from the parents because the parents want to leave it to the kids, but don't want to change everything. You know, yeah. it's like, this is the way we've always done it. So I've had several of them out to master classes. And so trying to get their parents on board with new processes and new systems have been very difficult. So it, it, sometimes it's very difficult keeping those parents around. Yeah. There's a, a little value to them, but most of all, you want them to <laughs> go yeah. away and say, Hey, I got this, <laughs> but uh, the other thing is, is, uh, the financial readiness of the business is, uh, so it's attractive to banks or institutions or the SBA because your kid can buy your business from you or an employee can buy the business from you based on the performance of the business more so right. than their credit worthiness. Even, I mean, they still have to be credit worthy, but that's going to be a huge factor is can you show that information to the bank to say, yeah, this business can pay back the loan. And in some cases it's, it's um, putting that debt together to show that, yeah, I'm, I'm lowering my expenses. I can actually buy him out and lower my expenses, my monthly expenses by paying off all this additional debt at a lower interest rate. Yeah. And that's, that's where, the exit planning, that strategy of, of building valuable that's, or value that's transferable, that's where that really helps out because you're building something that can't be transferred. You're, you're making sure that you have contracts in place because from a finan um, financing perspective, if the bank sees that you have a lot of contracts in place and you've got basically guaranteed income, that's going to go a long way uh, versus saying, yeah, we've got you know two main customers that we work with. And then we've got, you know, that's 25, 30% of our business. And then we've got all these smaller pieces. Um, that's not going to look so good, right? So if you're focusing on that from an early stage in the business, you're going to be a, a lot more valuable when you get there. It's going to be a lot easier to make that transition. So, And what I find is a lot of people, will, if somebody shows interest in buying their business, they want to see what that person's going to say and see if it's worth it without thinking it through themselves. So you really, when you go to that table, you're in better control. If, if you're thinking of that process and how that's going to go, you don't want to leave it up to the other person to tell you, you know, maybe you hear them out first before you come in with what your idea is. Mm -hmm. But um, so many people just don't have, they're not mentally ready for this stage. I recommend having an advisory board, you know, and it, it and, you want to have a team around you. You want to have people that their only goal is to help you. It's not to serve, you know, anyone else. It's to help advise you. And so, you know, that team would have a financial planner that understands your personal finances and, and what you want to do. You would have a CPA that's familiar with your books, but you also may have a separate one that actually does the valuation and things like that, because, there's a big difference between the CPA that you use to file your taxes and a CPA that does valuations. Um, they're completely different businesses. And so you want to make sure that you have um, you know, both of those people in the, on the team. And it might be that it's the same person. They may have a firm that has multiple people there and you can use different people under that same umbrella. But you want to have 
um, the financial planner, the CPA, the valuation analyst, you want to have the, the SEPA, the certified exit planning advisor or the value advisor. You want to have your estate planning attorney. Um, you want to have, because that's going to control a lot of, you know, if something happens to you, what happens to the shares of your business, how are they transferred? You know, if you have a buy sell agreement, we had mentioned that, but if you have a buy sell agreement, you know, how it's funded, where it goes. Um, and then you want to make sure you've got a business attorney that has you know, contracts in place with your, your employees and things like that, whether it's non-solicit or non-competes and things. Um, you want to have that team around you and, you know, probably your spouse. Um, you know, and if you have a son or daughter or something like that, really you trust that you know that you want to be a part of that conversation, then you know, bringing them into that team so that everybody's on the same page. Uh, that's going to be really important and, and it'll help you prepare along the way too, because you're able to make sure that things are where you want them to be. You know, you've really got a, a good team around you. I wasn't nearly that prepared. Uh, um, we used a, a business coach who I trust, um, yeah. but I wanted a, at least a mediator. You know, my son hires that business coach to this mm -hmm. day. He's, he's been on his team um, but you know, just, just a go between somebody yeah. that can, uh, you know, help both parties understand what's fair and, and what's not, but our deal yeah, depends on pretty, you know, the pretty, size of your business is going to help determine some of that too. You may not need some of those people just because the business isn't large enough. I mean, you're not, you're not doing multi-millions a year. It's, it might be you're, you're in a million a year. Okay. You probably have a few less headaches that you're having to to deal with anyway so one thing i love about it though is that you can really create anything you can write anything into the contracts you want you can you can be as creative as you want the mm -hmm. time frame to paying off the business any kind of interest rate or any other kind of compensation a lot of these people own their building so you can write into it how long you can sign a lease make it a separate llc sign a lease so they have to lease the building from you for X amount of years. Um, there, there's just so many ways to skin the cat, you know, that you can really uh, be as creative as you want. There's not a way to do it. And that's yeah. the thing we're talking about in the beginning is evaluating the business. There, there's just not one way to do it. Um, so, and, and so, business, you know, that last, that last piece, that decide stage, that, that third stage is really just about understanding what your options are. So who are the buyers? Who, who do you want to sell to? You know, because it might be that, yeah, you want to sell it to your, your child, but they're not interested. Right. So then are you going to sell it to a third party that wants to come in and, and be involved in the business and, and be there day to day? Or do you want somebody that's, you know, kind of like, well, I guess the, the people that were looking to buy your business, the blind devotion, like they were buying it for strategic reasons. They yeah. wanted in, entry into your market and, you know, they were willing to pay for it. And yeah, maybe it didn't work out, but, um, but that was kind of, you know, that's different type of buyer. And um, you've got, you know, ESOP plans where, are you familiar with Publix? And I'm trying to think of some of the other big companies, but Publix is a huge grocery store chain. And they're employee owned. I mean, they have an employee stock option plan and that's, you know, it's owned by the ESOP. And so, hmm. you know, a lot of those, those um, employees there have been around and stick around for a long time. You know, they have a, a very clear path of, of what it looks like um, to get into their management and everything. And they stick around because day one, you know, you start to become an owner, you get some small shares, you know, kind of as you get yeah. started and it's not much. But over time, it really adds up. Um, oh, yeah. I've got a client that, that worked for them for years and, and she retired and had you know, $1.7 million saved just from that company. Not, not from other stuff, but just you know, from the company and how well it's done while she's been working there. So um, that's sometimes an incentive. There's drawbacks to it too, but, but understanding what those options are and who the buyers are and who you want to sell to it's really important and that's going to help you prepare for the due diligence that, that they're going to bring at you when they're ready to buy it, especially the third parties and the strategic buyers or financial buyers. That due diligence is going to be rough. 
unless you're prepared for it. And and there's other subjects too, Chris, that we can go on forever. Oh with. yeah. So, uh, <laughs> and so I'll try to keep this to be about an hour, but um, what is a uh, good contact information for you? And yeah, I'll share so, it also in the thread, but. Yeah. The easiest way to get in touch with me is probably through LinkedIn. I stay on there quite a bit um, just with messaging. It, it's, it's not hard to reach out. And uh, the name's Chris Allman, A-L-M-A-N. Um, but you can also check us out at, at the website, um, which is brownfinancialadvisory.com. Um, you know, feel free to just shoot me an email as well. It's chris at brownfinancialadvisory.com. And you know, just love to connect with you and, and see if there's any questions I can help answer. Um, yeah, I, I think at the end of the day, my goal is to educate owners because, you know, had family members that own businesses that were left with nothing when they got ready to retire and, you know, just seeing it over and over and over how many businesses don't sell and how many of them have just poured everything into it. Uh, I just want to change that. So I just yeah. want to see people have more success. Right. Yeah, me too. All right, Chris, sounds good. Well, thank you for joining the show. Yeah. Happy to. And, uh, Thank you guys for joining the Flooring Business Podcast. And remember, if you're ready for sales training, just send me a message and we'll get you signed up. And if you really want to grow your business fast, I have the Flooring Business Accelerator Program. Started a new program too that's going to help with uh, consulting on demand. Um, But you can contact me at jerry at profitnowwithjerry.com for more information. And you guys have a great profitable week.